The science of medicine is forever learning and evolving. And before the invention of the stethoscope in 1819, there were a variety of ways that the medical profession sought to confirm that someone was indeed dead. Some of these were extreme, some of them were just plain bizarre. Before we begin, we post death and dying related content every Friday. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, consider subscribing to the channel. Now let's talk confirming death throughout history. Before we begin, most of these examples come from Europe because most available information on the topic from this time comes from this area. Secondly, before you judge our ancestors as being primitive simpletons for using some of these methods, remember they were doing the best with what they knew. Just like in a hundred years time in the future, they will probably be looking back at us and thinking we were a bit stupid. We're just working with what we got. Our ancestors intelligence got us here, remember that. Thirdly, you might say, well, why didn't they just wait till they started decomposing? The idea of waiting a week or two to have a funeral like a lot of places do nowadays would be unthinkable to many people back in the day. It would be disrespectful to the deceased and worse, disrespectful to God. So most people were buried within 24 hours, often sooner. But also people back then were still people, just like you and me. And they didn't want to have to witness their loved one decomposing, would you? Okay, with all that in mind, let's go back to the 1700s. So it's 1750 and you've just died from one of the many, many diseases of the era. Without the modern convenience of an ECG or even a stethoscope, the medical men of the time would have no surefire way to determine that you were well and truly dead rather than just unconscious. Not wanting to bury you alive obviously, they decide to test your body for signs of life. And they had many ideas of how to do so, including smelling salts. Smelling salts which release a small amount of potent ammonia gas have been used to revive the fainted for centuries. It's been used throughout Roman times, the medieval times, all over the place really. Smelling salts revive fainted people by stimulating the inhalation reflex. When the body senses ammonia gas, the mucous membranes immediately become irritated which triggers rapid inhalation. This rapid inhalation counters the slowing respiration and the heart that typically accompanies fainting. For cases of mild unconsciousness due to fainting, smelling salts would bring about a miraculous reversal. However, for someone in a coma or with a severe head injury, smelling salts alone weren't going to be able to prove that you were indeed dead. Holding a corpse's finger over a candle. While 18th century medical practitioners didn't truly understand the nature of the human body and its circulatory system, they did recognize that blood circulation was required for life. Checking pulses was not yet widespread or standardized, but there were ways of testing the blood circulation that were widely practiced. The most common method was to hold the finger of the deceased over a candle. Not only would the heat from the flame possibly produce a reaction, but the light shining through the finger would show if the blood was circulating or pooling. In a genuinely dead body, blood pools in the extremities. Since the heart is no longer beating and circulating blood, it pulls in the extremities and low-lying areas. If a dead body's finger were examined over a candle and no pain response was produced from the flame and the blood appeared to be pulling in the fingertips, making them darker than normal, an 18th century doctor would be relatively sure that the person was dead. Of course, we now know that some diseases and conditions can cause blood to pull while still alive, but the medical arts back then wouldn't have been able to save them anyway. Sticking a thermometer into the corpse's stomach. One of the more ingenious methods of determining death in the 18th century was the use of a thanometer, literally meaning death measurer. Dr. Nass designed this long thermometer in 1841 as a tool to more accurately gauge if an unconscious person was indeed dead. Aside from the obvious reaction that would be obtained by a sort of a massive thermometer into someone's stomach, the vice also cleverly checked to ensure that the core body temperature was consistent with being dead. This method was likely beneficial for for cases where limbs had gotten cold but the vital organs remained working and generating body temperature. Though if they were still alive, the infection that this was likely to cause would have killed them anyway as antibiotics weren't exactly a thing yet and puncturing someone's stomach isn't exactly great for the insides. Luckily, while we no longer need to take someone's stomach temperature to determine death, NASA's method is still used in determining how long a body has likely been dead for. Inserting a heart flag. 
One popular German method of the time for testing death was to jam a long needle with a flag on one end of it into the heart of the suspected recently deceased. In this case, it is said that the flag would reportedly unfurl and wave as the heart was still beating. It isn't entirely clear how the inventor thought the mechanical beating of the heart would unfurl a flag attached to a dull needle, but regardless, the test was put into practice and used in the latter half of the 19th century. Using invisible ink and corpse gas. French physician Servine Incard was always looking for ways to prove death. And in a test more fitting for the pages of a spy novel, he wrote, I am not dead on a piece of paper made from invisible ink, made of the acetate of lead. He would then place this paper by the deceased nose. One of the gases produced by the decomposition process is sulfur dioxide. When acetate of lead is exposed to sulfur dioxide, it causes the acetate to discolor and become visible on the page. While this was certainly a dramatic way to prove death, it was unfortunately extremely unreliable. First, sulfur dioxide can be exhaled from a living human with some dental diseases and tonsillitis. Second, not all corpses reliably produce sulfur dioxide in the quantities near the nose to trip Incard's test. An English doctor attempted to recreate Incard's method and found that only one out of every six corpses triggered the message. Sticking the corpse's finger in your ear. In the same vein as Dr. Incard, Dr. Leon decided to make a name for himself by inventing a new manner to test to death. His method involved putting the corpse's finger in your ear. Yeah. He argued that the involuntary muscle movements in a living person's finger would create a buzzing sound in the ear of a trained physician while a dead person's wouldn't. I mean, points for originality, I guess, but this same dude said that you could detect the certain diseases through the same method. Brushing the skin. A professor by the name of M. Weber created a death test so revered he won 5,000 French francs for his work. Professor Weber argued that a corpse should have a patch of skin vigorously rubbed with a brush for a few hours after death. If the skin looked irritated, the person wasn't dead. If the skin took on a parchment-like appearance, then that was confirmation that they were deceased. Commoners and barber surgeons used a more practical yet irritating version of the test, rubbing the skin with an annoying or thorned weed. Anyone who's encountered stinging nettles would agree that the plant likely would raise people from the dead, especially if you rubbed it all over their chest and back. The reasoning behind this layman's test was similar to the professor's. If the skin on the body responded to the application of the irritating plant, it would stand to reason that the nervous and circulatory systems were still working in some way. Trying electric shocks. Galvanism, or the science of producing muscular movement through electricity, was invented by Italian scientist Luigi Galvani at the end of the 18th century. His discovery would ignite popular imagination, ultimately inspiring Mary Shelby's Frankenstein, for which the cadaver is given new life through electricity. In more practical terms, scientists quickly realized that galvanism to test for muscular activity could be a new way to test for the certainty of death, and it started to be implemented in 1805. Research at the time indicated that galvanism was indeed a rigorous test for proving death. Though the machinery was expensive at the time, so few hospitals could afford to use it. Probably for the best, as too much electric shock was known to definitely make sure someone was dead, even if they weren't to begin with. Yanking the tongue. Dr. Laborde wrote an entire thesis on resuscitating dead people by yanking on their tongues. While in theory, tugging on a tongue could help clear the airway of a choking person, it isn't going to do much for someone in a coma beyond being incredibly irritating. However, Laborde was so devoted to his method that he went on to invent a device specifically for yanking tongues that he would gladly sell to mortuary workers. He claimed that if the tongue was yanked on by his invention for three hours and the corpse didn't revive, it was well and truly really dead. And I bet the mortuary workers were real happy to stand there for an extra three hours every day yanking on tongues. Not to be out down with a mere tongue yanking, another doctor decided that pulling on nipples was the right way to determine mortality. And he invented specific nipple pliers for such a thing. His rather horrifying methodology involved applying clawed clamps, because apparently regular clamps weren't painful enough, to the recently deceased nipples and yanking on them. It is hard to argue with his logic that it would surely waken someone from a slumber, but his test was widely disputed and ridiculed even in his own time. It also wasn't lost on people at the time that nipple pliers had been common torture methods in the past, and they weren't thrilled about someone doing the same to their dead. Burning the skin. Burning the skin was used in numerous ways to test for the presence of actual death. In the most popular form, scalding water was dumped on parts of the presumed deceased body. 
The belief was that the shock of boiling water would be so hot it would surely wake someone out of a non-lethal slumber. Other doctors burned the tips of noses with similar goal of shocking the presumed deceased out of a coma-like state. An English scientist by the name of Barnett took a more scientific approach to burning and determined that if the skin didn't blister when exposed to heat, the person was indeed dead. Barnett's method involved using scalding water on the arm of a presumed corpse. No blistering was a sure sign of no life. It isn't clear what he said to do should the arm blister but the deceased not wake up still. One also wonders how this method squared up to the knowledge that bodies could burn, which was doubtlessly known due to house fires and burning of witches back in the day. Blistering is also a part of the natural decomposition process, which certainly would have complicated Barnett's methodology. Blowing smoke with sun don't shine. In an era where nicotine was still viewed as a wonder drug and often prescribed to asthmatics and pregnant women, it is perhaps no surprise that tobacco smoke enemas were considered a valid medical treatment. First arrived as a treatment for drowning, tobacco smoke enemas were believed to warm the body of the drowning victim from the inside, also stimulating the instinct to breathe. Unfortunately, cholera was rampant during the 18th and 19th centuries and the whole mouth to butt way of performing these enemas ended up killing off a lot of medics. However, they powered on and billows were invented merely to replace the need for human ventilation. With this safety device in place, the use of smoke enemas was expanded to test for mortality. It was believed that someone only in a stupor would be warmed and driven to breathe by both the billow action and the stimulant effect of nicotine. This treatment likely killed far more people than a save thanks to the cholera and it wasn't a very effective method for testing for death either. Cutting off a finger. Yep, it's exactly what it says on the package, and sadly this test wasn't even grounded in any particular good science. Practitioners weren't looking for slowed, coagulated, or even lack of blood streaming from the wound. No, they were keeping their fingers crossed that the shock of having your finger chopped off would jolt the presumed deceased back to life. While other finger tests did have some science to it, like holding the finger over a candle to look for circulation, this one was just simple and brutal. One cannot imagine a more depressing event. You're in a coma in the 18th century and no one knows how to rouse you, so they cut off your finger. You miraculously come and wake out of your coma and now you're still likely to die due to septus and you're missing a finger. Great! Practicing foot torture. Early forensic scientists weren't content with simply chopping off fingers and electrocuting the recently deceased. One of the most common and widely practiced death tests throughout Europe was foot torture. As bad as it sounds, the actual practice might be even slightly worse than one imagines. Standard techniques used to create pain in the hopes of jolting the recently deceased awake include shoving long needles under their toenails and slicing the sole with razor blades. The belief was that pain and shock of hurting an extremely sensitive foot was the surest way to bring someone out of a deep faint or stupor. In many areas, the foot test was all that was needed to conclude that a corpse could be safely buried. Inserting irons. Speaking of red hot irons, when other methods failed to find a person alive, some bright sparks decided to give one more thing a try, inserting red hot irons into the body's various holes. The doctors who practiced this back in the day were not favored by the many and often only asked for by those with extreme cases where death seemed unlikely. Naturally, with all these strange methods going about, people in the 17 and 1800s were often more than a bit fearful of being buried alive. So they came up with some other options just in case they weren't completely dead when buried. Coffins with emergency release mechanisms. Christian Elzenbrandt was an inventor and created the elaborate safety coffin in 1843. Instead of hinges, the casket was designed with complicated systems of levers and pulleys attached to a ring that would be placed on the deceased finger. If they awoke to find themselves in the coffin, them simply shifting in fear would spring open the top of the casket. It also had a mesh lid so the deceased would be able to see through the top if they woke up. It should be noted that the inventor meant for these to give peace of mind to mourners. Remembering home wakes were the norm back then, he counseled families to leave the deceased in their safety casket until decomposition began, at which point they could be safely buried. Safety Coffin A German physician, Johann Tagberger, patented a coffin that would allow those buried alive to ring a bell from within the casket that would alert the graveyard caretakers that someone had been buried alive. Early models of the safety casket only included a key that would allow the buried to unlock the casket. It wasn't entirely clear how the now not deceased was supposed to deal with the many feats of dirt piled above them, but oh well. Tagberger's model, however, also had one big flaw. 
Dead bodies are capable of ringing bells too. As dead bodies begin to decay, they bloat and swell from the gases caused by decomposition. This swelling would cause bodies to trip the bell. Imagine being the poor grave caretaker and hearing the ring assuming that you just buried some poor soul alive. You quickly evacuate the grave expecting to find an angry but alive person only to see a rather gross decaying corpse. It isn't clear that Tagberger's device ever saved anyone, but one could imagine that it took quite a few years off many grave takers lives just from the shock. Waiting for the body to rot. Of all the 18th century death tests, this is undoubtedly the simplest and shows the abundance of common sense. Of course it does, the practice was started in Germany. Not sure if someone is dead? Just wait a couple days, especially in summer. While it seems careless, given the lack of technology and medical knowledge of the time, just waiting a few days before burial was the most credible and specific way to ensure death. If the body showed no signs of rotting, then there was good reason to believe that the person wasn't dead. This practical idea led to the establishment of waiting mortuaries in Germany and throughout other countries in Europe, where nurses would watch over an entire ward of corpses to make sure that they rotted as they should. While this was effective, it wasn't terribly popular as nurses didn't much care for watching over an entire room of slowly decaying bodies. Despite packing the waiting mortuaries full of flowers in an attempt to mask the smell, it wasn't very beneficial. Loved one and mourners also didn't care for funerals featuring putrid bodies that had been left out unattended for several days. So while yes, it was sensible and practical, the practice of waiting mortuaries still left a great deal to be desired for mourners in the 19th century. Many other methods of confirming death were used throughout the past and throughout different regions. And while thanks to science it is now rare for someone to be buried alive, regrettably it does still happen around the world. And those are just the cases that we know about because the person was rescued. Who knows how many others haven't been found in time. And I suppose that's one plus for embalming, you will definitely be dead after that. And with that, go talk death.